Many of us are really looking forward to the return of professional sports to our lives and to our screens, and so too are the money-making giants behind some of the biggest American teams. But the question is how to get players back out there as safely as possible. Mark Cuban owns the NBA's Dallas Mavericks, and he says they have no immediate plans to reopen pra practice arenas. A billionaire investor and star of the TV show Shark Tank, he's also an advisor on President Trump's new economic panel. He's joining our Walter Isaacson to talk about the challenges faced by American businesses right now. Thank you, Christian and Mark. Mark Cuban, welcome to the show. Thanks, Walter. Thanks for having me. Man, you're on the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, what are you going to be looking for when you and the other owners and Adam Silver have to decide whether to open up the NBA? Safety. I mean, we're not going to put our players, we're not going to put, put any essential personnel or anybody at risk. Um, not that we can eliminate risk entirely, but, you know, we're, we're going to do our best. I, I like to think we'll use the White House protocol since that's probably, they probably had the best source of information and science available to them. You know, probably the steps that they take are the steps I'd like to see taken for our players. So the White House, they test people every day. Would you want to be able to test your employees, everybody there every day in an ideal world? Well, it just depends on the circumstances, obviously. There's some employees that just may work from home, and, you know, it depends on are they taking public transportation, what they feel, how they feel about things. You know, there, there's civil rights issues. It, it's got to be something we all come to an agreement on. But if it's a non-invasive test that's easy with quick results and readily available so we're not taking it away from those in need, yeah, I'd like to test them every day. You hired secret shoppers, you know, people to go around to businesses that were reopening in the Dallas area where you are. What did you find? Um, uh, what I found was that only 36% of businesses even opened up, which kind of surprised me. I thought it'd be a lot more. I found that it was difficult for the small businesses to invest in the tools and the changes that are needed to enable social distancing, enable you know, supporting the protocols that were recommended by the CDC and the state. Um, I found that, you know, as we talked more after the fact, there's a lot of confusion on how even they can use the PPP money. Um, you know, one of the challenges is you can't use the PPP money and get reimbursed uh, if you use it to upgrade your facilities or your location or your retail. And so I found a lot of frustration um, on the part of business owners. Why did you do it? Because I'm curious, right? I mean, I want to know what's going on. I mean, as I said earlier, I, I, I believe in data. And so the more information available, the better the decisions I can make for myself, my businesses, my family. And remember, that creates a baseline. It wasn't meant to be a final determination. It wasn't meant to be, you know, we, we didn't release any names. It was a completely anonymous survey. Of the businesses your secret shoppers went to see, uh, what were the problems? Were they complying with health regulations, social distancing, wearing masks? I mean, the, the greatest issues were compliance with some of the, the more detailed things, you know, not um, removing everything from a table at a restaurant, you know, to, so that they can properly clean it, um, not having masks on all employees. But again, I think that those are the types of things that over time will be rectified, which is why we're going to survey again, and we'll see what happens. If you had been governor or if you were the president, do you feel that's something that the government should be doing? Yes. I mean, I think we need to be more informative. You know, the, the White House, you know, the federal government should have access to the best information, the best data, the best scientists, the best doctors, hopefully, and we should be sharing the, the best, you know, methodologies for getting back open. You know, I, you know, I, um, being in, in my role with the um, Open the Economy Council, they assigned a liaison to me. And, and just yesterday, I sent them an email asking, you know, what's the process to try to get the Treasury to allow small businesses who get PPP loans to use part of that funding to upgrade their businesses where they need to to make it as safe as possible and adhere to those protocols and not get penalized in uh, by having it not be reimbursed. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that I would have done just differently. You talk about the PPP loans, the payroll protection, uh, things that are supposed to go to small businesses so they don't have to lay people off. And you kind of imply that the banks uh, are doing it in not a very careful, a very methodical way. How would you change that? 
I would have done an overdraft protection program. Look, the goal, the, the, the amazing thing that happened with PPP is that it was passed very quickly. The unfortunate side of it was that it was funded very slowly. And it was a timing issue that was most important. And so we needed to have companies feel like they can continue business as usual and retain their employees. But that delay from the time the program was approved to the time when businesses were funded were not funded and we had to get to a second tranche, that created a lot of problems. And what I would have done is allowed companies to continue friction-free with the way they were doing business, but provide for overdraft protection so that you couldn't bounce checks for any payroll or specific business-associated expenses. And then the banks who were funding those overdrafts would be made whole by the, the Fed on a daily basis. That would allow businesses to continue mm -hmm. doing business as usual, retain their employees. And I think that would have created more more confidence by employees that they were gonna be able to keep their jobs. All this delay and everything just created so much confusion. And now still, a lot of those recipients of PPP are in a state of suspended animation. They don't know how to spend their money. What should they do now? If the president and his council that you're on was asked, how should we fix this mess? What would you say? First thing, you, you gotta get data, right? We can't just wing it. You know, whether it's the White House or there's new programs now trying to come from the Democrats, um, that are trying to emulate what happened in, in Europe, That's it's too late to do that. We need to talk to small businesses and find out exactly where they are. And number two, and I think this is even more important, we need to, to stimulate demand, consumer demand, because unless people are confident that they have jobs, they're not going to spend money on anything but rent, essentials, and basic expenses. They're not going to spend on the, the random things, and they're going to save too much money um, and so the economy won't have the demand side that we need. And two thirds of GDP is customer consumer demand. And so, so how do you stimulate com, co consumer demand? You create a jobs program. You know, we've, we've never seen anything like this before. You know, 30 plus million jobs lost in two months. You know, another 20 plus million underemployed or losing hours. So 50 million, give or take, that are in a precarious situation. The only way we're going to start to chip away at that is by creating a federal jobs program. And we have things that we need, you know, um, tra tracking and tracing. We talk, you know, about testing. You can train people to do those jobs, deal with HIPAA compliance, et cetera, so they can do that job. We have um, a population, not just elderly population, but a population of people that have pre existing conditions that are going to be hesitant to go out and use resources, ha hiring and training people to support them and help them in every community across the country. That's millions of jobs that we can create that, that we can, you know, pay $30,000 or more, you know, give them health care benefits because we haven't even started to talk about health care and the problem there because unless people feel confident that their health is going to be taken care of, particularly since people are, are avoiding the hospitals and avoiding doctors right now where they may be closed, until we started taking care of the job security and health care security, people are not going to spend money, but we're not addressing either of those issues right now. But what you're talking about seems to be a pretty massive expansion of the federal government's uh, size and role in the economy. What type of pushback do you get, if any, from the Trump administration and the people on his council? Actually, not that much. I mean, I don't think they're taking it, you know, when I mention it to them, I don't think they're taking it seriously, so they haven't pushed back a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll keep on pushing because I don't think we have a choice. You know, we're not private. Historically, we've looked to private business to create jobs, and I've been a big fan of that. Historically, we've, we've looked at trickle-down economics, and it's an easy argument to say why that hasn't worked out well for the bottom. But we historically, we've never had 50 million people effectively unemployed or underemployed and had that created in two months. And, you know, desperate times call for different, if not desperate measures. And that's where we are now. So we're going to have to take different steps and all dogma, all partisanship has got to be discarded immediately. You've never been, if I'm correct, a big fan of unions. Has no. this helped change your perspective? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question. I mean, you know, now we're, you know, historically unions, well, it depends on where. You know, if you go back to the 20s, unions had their need. I mean, I read up in Sinclair, you know, in school like everybody else. Um, but, you know, over the last 20 years, I haven't been as big a fan. I'm not against them, just not a huge fan. But now, you know, we've got to make sure that that employees are taken care of because 
we're, again, unique circumstances. We, we, this needs to be bottom up. We need to make sure that employees are taken care of, that they're compensated correctly, that their health care is taken care of correctly. In a perfect world, employers would do that automatically. Um, and for organizations where that's taken care of, maybe there's not a need for unions. But where, where there's scenarios, you know, like we've seen with meatpacking plants, where people have really put employees' health at risk and haven't taken the precautions ne necessary, absolutely there's a need for unions. Are you still paying your hourly workers uh, who can't be coming into work? Um, we pay, we're, I'm paying all of our Mavericks employees. And so for the arena employees that were paid per game, we paid them through the end of the regular season, but we also partnered with an organization, uh, oh, what's it? It's called Get Shift, S-H-I-F-T, done, um, dot org or dot com. And what, when then we contributed money to that organization. And what they did was they go to nonprofits and other organizations who need people to come in and work by the hour. And this application, um, uh, people who need our hours for work, download the app and it notifies them. And so I donated money to create hours for our employees and anybody for that matter to be able to pick up hours and make some money. If you were advising medium sized businesses, big businesses, would you tell them avoid layoffs? If they can afford it, of course. You know, there's a bigger picture here. If, you know, no business survives without consumer demand, and, and obviously there's a cascading issue. So, yeah, if you can, if you can afford it, I mean, uh, Salesforce.com, Bank of America, there's a lot of companies that are really stepping up from an employment perspective, um, and that's going to be important. And, you know, the bottom line is those companies who don't take care of their employees, their brands are going to be destroyed. I mean, they'll be, they'll be talked about forever as examples of what not to do. You want to give me some examples? No. And yeah, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. Um, look, this is hard for everybody. You know, Walter, it comes down to this. this. This is the thought process every American is making right now. Who do I trust with my life? Because the decisions I make for myself, my family, my employees may potentially be life or death. You know, and even if not death, the impairment, we haven't ever even discussed the, the impairment rates, blood clocks, heart, you know, kidney disease, neuro, neurological problems. We, we, that's not even part of the discussion or, or risk profile. And so who do I t trust with my life? And we're not, we don't have that person right now. There isn't somebody or a group or organization that we just point to and say, you know what? I know the data from there, the recommendations, the ideas coming from them are well thought out, well planned, and I'm going with what they say. That's a real challenge right now, and that's why I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Uh, should that be coming from the president? Be coming from the White House. Yeah, if not the president, then somebody he assigns. And so do you feel that's happened? No, not at all. Not even a little bit. And that's the problem. Explain that more. Why, uh, why has it been a problem and what should be done? I mean, like I said, <laughs> we're all asking ourselves a very basic question. How do I protect my family? And... To answer that question, you have to ask, who do I trust with my life? What sources of information? And the hope would be that that comes from the president. And to his credit, at the beginning, he tried. That's where we, that's how we met Dr. Fauci, and that's how we met Dr. Burks. And he, he deferred to people. But you know, more recently, it's been just a crap show of, of, of you know everybody else is to blame and every other topic. And you know, they're just there. There's nothing that's being said or done right now to. to that gives me or I think anybody confidence that this is who we need to trust. I mean, you have Dr. Burke saying, you know, being condescending towards the CDC. You have people, you know, saying the CDC is changing data and there's, there's just nobody that's standing up and saying, no, these are the facts. This is what you can trust. This is what's happening right now. This is what we recommend. I think the economy would rebound more quickly if we had more confidence in our leaders. So do you think that the political people in the White House are making this too much of a partisan issue, unlike the Dr. Fauci's who are trying to keep it based on the science? And are they looking, and is the president looking more to his own political survival versus just trying to be a straightforward, effective communicator? I think all politicians are making this too political. I mean, when you hear the president speak, it's always, you know, the Democrats this, the Democrats that, Obama this, Obama that. And when you hear Chuck Schumer speak, it's the Republicans won't let us do this, the Republicans won't let us do that. This is what this is where leaders need to become leaders, you know, and get beyond it. They were able to do it for the CARE program. And I thought, oh my goodness, maybe we're getting past at least part of the partisanship and dogma. But again, 
do I think the president is doing a good job? No. Do I think Schumer's doing a good job? No. Do I think Pelosi's doing a good job? No. Do I think, you know, McConnell's doing a good job? No. Any single one of them could stand up and show any level of leadership, and I think they'd get a lot of people behind them. And do you think we've also lost the leadership ability globally? Yeah, that's gone. Yeah, we're no longer leaders. Now, it's, again, four years, it's four years, not a lifetime, you know, um, and so I think that's it's reclaimable, but we've got to we've got to recognize that, particularly dealing with a pandemic like this, this is a global issue, and we're a global citizen, and we, we're getting into the habit of trying to place blame. You know, one of my friends asked me a simple question: What if China invents the vaccine first? Are they going to give it to us? You know, and not because you know, they're bad people. That's not what I think at all. I think, you know, just the disharmony, the, the conflict that's been created uh, at a, you know, at a government level, you know, are we going to, if we come up with it first, are we going to share it with them? I mean, that's terrifying when you think about it, that it's just not obvious that anybody who comes up with the vaccine should share it with the world immediately. And that's what we should be saying. Hey, world, you know, we're all in this together. You know, from what I read, we've brought in scientists from around the world to work together to help solve this. Let's make it clear that this is whoever solves it, whether it's us or anybody else, or whether it's a, a coalition that solves it, that whatever we come up with is made available to everybody in the world. Because otherwise, we're segregating the world and they may decide to segregate us and work together. You know, we're able to rebound from this because. The United States dollar is the reserve currency for the world. If we lose that, yeah, I mean, there's just, we need changes. I mean, we need, think, we need people to think differently. What type of uh, companies would you like to see pitched on Shark Tank, your show, uh, coming out of this pandemic? You know, we're basically starting with a blank slate on what America 2.0 can be. And there's going to be entrepreneurs out there who have amazing ideas that I don't even, you know, I, I can't even conceive of right now. And that's exactly what we need. You know, 20 years, 25 years from now, whatever it is, and we look back to the pandemic of 2020, I think we're going to recognize that there were 5, 10, 20, 25 or more world-class companies that basically changed the world that were created as a result. And those are the companies I want to see. Hopefully, I'm smart enough to invest in them. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been great to be with you again, Mark. Always, Walter. I always appreciate it. Thank you.